must continue to work on passing federal legislation, the For the People Act, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. This past year has taken a historic approach to address the lasting impacts of systemic racism. This year has brought about many efforts from current leaders, civil rights activists, and countless protesters taking action against continued issues faced by African Americans. But we come here to speak the moral truth. Issues like voter suppression, discriminatory employment, housing practices, and police brutality. And with much progress in the right direction, there still remains a constant demand for society to value the lives and humanity of black people. Black America, we don't understand why we so dangerous running away from you. Hello everyone and thanks for joining us. I'm Ken Watlington. Today, we honor the struggles and triumphs of African Americans through mind, body and soul. As we continue dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic, people of color have been disproportionately impacted due to legal, social and economic inequities. And with that, the church has become one of the most trusted institutes within the black community. The oldest black church in Jacksonville celebrates its heritage throughout Black History Month. Now on your side's Claire Curry takes a look at their past and the present. The Sandy Run Missionary Baptist Church first brick facility was built across the street from a tree the congregation was rooted from. Today, they continue to grow and spread their message through the community. What makes this church strong is really the foundation that it was built on. It was built on belief in God. In 1854, the Sandy Run Missionary Baptist Church was established. It was founded uh, during the time of slavery and across the street uh, was a, a, a bush area where the slaves were allowed to worship. Grover Lewis III is the chairman trustee ministry of the church. He has been involved with the church for years. Although a number of pastors have passed through here, uh, the church is not the pastor. The church is, 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 is worshiping the Lord, and that's what uh, has been happening here. Joel Churchwell is the current pastor of the ministry. He was elected pastor in 2004. Coming in, realizing the significance and the prominence this church had within the community uh, kind of put me in the mindset, wow, I've got some big shoes to fill. Lewis and Churchwell both faced hardships within the church during their years there. First Hurricane Florence in 2018 and then the pandemic in 2020. When the, uh, the storm hit uh, prior to the pandemic, we were displaced. Uh, we didn't have a church home. So many memories were attached to it, but the storm kind of solidified, hey, we've got to make some, we've got to move forward. Even though there were struggles, the ministry was able to grow and expand in the long run. Now that this space has equipped us to look beyond the walls, uh, it's caused us to begin to rethink and retool how we're going to meet the needs of the community. Just because we have new four walls doesn't mean that we stay inside. Continuing growth and keeping history alive is Sandy Run's purpose. For Honoring Black History, I'm Claire Curry. This next story is going viral. Well, the person you're about to meet is with more than half a million followers on social media. One Eastern North Carolina native is using good soul food to take her worldwide. I love where I'm from and I love sharing my passion for Southern food. She's gone viral on social media thanks to that passion. Some know her as spilling the sweet tea, but her real name is Carlina Davis and she's an Eastern North Carolina native. I figured I'd join you for my kitchen. Now calling Marilyn home, I caught up with Davis on Zoom to talk about her roots. I am from Kenston, born and raised, Kenston High School graduate. And it's in Lenore County where Carlina's mother taught her how to cook at a young age. The love grew over time. And about five years ago, she started sharing that love with anyone with an internet connection, courtesy of her food blog called Spilling the Sweet Tea. And I came up with that um, back in 2017. Kind of a play on words, you know, spill the tea kind of means I'm going to share the gossip or share the word on the street. There, she shares some of her favorite recipes. But over time, Carlina branched out. I didn't think I was this person, right? This video person. That changed at the start of the pandemic, especially when social media app TikTok became all the craze. My stepdaughter taught me how to, how to, how to use it. <laughs> and I said, maybe I can show people how I make my food on TikTok, and that's how I started, April, I think March or April of 2020. And people are really gravitating to it. It definitely has blown my mind. Maybe the biggest mind-blowing moment came from a video she shared in January, highlighting a hometown favorite 
to her more than 540,000 followers on TikTok. If you ever find yourself in my hometown of Kenton, North Carolina, you must go to King's Barbecue and get you a pig and a puppy. I haven't been home since Thanksgiving, and I was craving it. I don't have a pig. I don't have a whole hog. I had a crock pot, and I definitely have a good hush puppy recipe. So I put the um, video together, and I wanted to let people know that this wasn't something I came up with. This is from King's Barbecue in Kansas, North Carolina. If you find yourself going to King's, make sure you let them know that Spilling the Sweet Tea sent you. But what makes the hundreds of thousands of followers and millions of likes even more remarkable is the fact that Carlina has a regular nine to five job. I do. I am a sales representative and, you know, I cook at night and, you know, edit my videos and post when I'm when I'm not working. But I do. I really love sharing my passion for food. It's amazing to me how these videos have reached even across the world. I actually just did a cooking demo for the folks in Australia. From down under to down south, the love of good food is universal. I'm just amazed at, at everything that has come my way since I started making these videos. And tasty recipes aren't the only thing Kinston has to offer. We'll take a look at the rich legacy of basketball in the city and how it's impacting the future when honoring black history returns. When you think of your hometown, can you name any NBA basketball players to come from there? Well, Kinston High School has a long list of Viking basketball players who have made it to the big leagues. Kinston recently dedicated a mural to honor these athletes and the long history of basketball success in the city. Nine of your science, Aaron Jenkins takes us there. These star athletes get their start as kids on outdoor courts like this one and in legendary gyms across the Kinston community. Holloway Gym, a place where dreams are built and the way has been paved. Cedric Maxwell, he was the uh, big, the beginning. Charles Shackleford, Jerry Stackhouse, Brandon Ingram, Reggie Bullock. But what do you think of when you think of Kinston? When you do say Kinston in certain cities, people, you know, they shake their head like, oh no, you know, because they think of the crime. But when you actually come here and spend time in here at Holloway, you see a different side of Kinston that people wouldn't normally talk about. The other side of Kinston, a rich history of basketball. People want to say it's in the water, it's this, it's that. I think it's primarily because of the Kinston Lenore County Parks and Recreation Department. The Recreation Department itself has so many gym facilities here that they have access to. We try to keep the doors open as much as possible. You can walk to stay in the gym, work out, uh, you're not worried about what's going on on the outside. And then you have coaches, we have staff to make sure that we keep everything that may hurt those kids on the outside. Elijah Rouse, known as Rouse House to the kids, is one of those coaches. Sometimes I get out there and play with them. Uh, sometimes I just stand in the doorway and watch them. And it's amazing how the game just come, it comes right to them. Some kids dealing with things at home uh, with their families. To get away sometime to come to the community center here at Holloway um, it, it's, it's an outlet for them. Looking back, every NBA star from Kinston has used this gym as an outlet. Look at the, the boards on the floor, when you look at the flags up here, when you look at those rims and you think about all the athletes and all the kids that have come through here. You could put together an NBA all-star team just with the, the athletes that have come through here. You see the gym's full every single night, and it's kids wanting to get better, wanting to be like their heroes, like Brandon Ingram and Reggie Bullock and Jerry Stackhouse and all the other kids that have come through. Those hometown heroes are now honored on a mural in Kinston. There's just something special about it, you know, and being a part of that now and seeing how important that history is and now having a mural to really commemorate that history and make a, a mark in the community like that. Uh, is was highly important to me. The legacy doesn't stop on the mural wall or even on the basketball court. There's not an athlete that I know of from Kinston that haven't came back home to give, to sow, 
to support the Kenton High program itself gets sixty-four to seventy thousand dollars from us buying uniforms for the, the basketball team, and we donate book bags and school supplies to the teachers. Well, Jerry Stackhouse will come. He's the, he'll he will come home every night and go to church. Reggie Bullock, you know, he'll come. He'll give. He's had tournaments and children counts, but Reggie Bullock will come home sometime, just open gym and come in here and just be in here. It, let the kids, it, it teaches them when I do make it big one day, when I do make it out the hood or out of the bad side of Kenton or even the good side of Kenton, come back and give to my city, to my community. As for the future of Kenton basketball. The expectation for these kids are just the same. They, they feel like that they can make it just like Brandon can make it. If you can play Kenton basketball, we feel like you can play anywhere in the world. People ask all the time, what do y'all do to those kids down there, man? You know, what are y'all teaching them? What are y'all putting in the water? It, it's almost like, you know, when you're born in Kenton, it's just in you. Honoring Black History, I'm Erin Jenkins. A tragic event granted an opportunity for African American heritage in Newburgh. Stay with us as we uncover what sparked African American recognition in the community coming up. One organization in the East is making sure their stories remain alive. The African American Heritage and Cultural Center started in 2019 and continues to educate the community on African American history. On your sites, Caitlin Richards sat down with leaders who tell only a small portion of what allowed African Americans to have a sense of community in Newburgh. There was a really strong and vibrant African American community right here in New Bern and all of Eastern North Carolina. The population of African Americans, our Negroes, our slaves, our color in New Bern was greater that than, than the white population. Because of one African American's initiative in New Bern, the African American community started to be recognized. Her name was Charlotte Roan. Charlotte Roan wanted to become a nurse. She applied several times to schools, nursing schools here in North Carolina. None of them would accept her. So she was eventually admitted to the School of Nursing at Howard, a historically black university, Howard University in Washington, D.C., and she did become a nurse. She returned to New Bern. But Charlotte still couldn't get a job in a hospital yet. In 1922, a fire in New Bern burned a large portion of the African-American community. New Bern only had a hospital for white people. The fire showed how much a hospital was needed, and Charlotte eventually created a hospital for African-Americans. She didn't stop there. Once they got the hospital up, they say our children, Negro children, needed a library. A year after the fire, she also created a hotel for African Americans. Having a hospital, hotel, church, and a library for African Americans is what allowed the African American community to start to feel noticed. Our children should be able to see where we have come from, from Africa in ships like sardines, but we are still making it and we're still experiencing good success. HBCU marching bands are more than just a sound. The impact they make both on and off the field ahead on honoring black history. In the late 1800s, it was illegal for African Americans to read and write. Now, historically black colleges and universities graduate some of the nation's top doctors, lawyers, engineers, and more. These institutions came to be in several ways. Some established by the federal government, others were started by white religious leaders or segregationists. Livingston College in Salisbury is a product of African American ministers. Descendants of freed slaves gave birth to this audacious idea of starting a school. You think about that, we're founded in 1879, so that's shortly after um, the Emancipation Proclamation, is shortly after Juneteenth. And they had a sneaky suspicion that education would be the true emancipator and not the document that President Lincoln signed. Livingstone, placed on a plot of land that was once a slave plantation, hosted the site of the first black collegiate football game. Now a 100-year-old tradition called the Commemorative Classic alternates between Salisbury and Charlotte-based HBCU Johnson C. Smith. 
But it's not just football that steals the show at historically black colleges and universities. Oftentimes, it's the marching bands. While people come for the game, it's the halftime show that really cements the experience. But as Rod Carter shows us, the work they do on the field has tremendous impact on the entire university. Whether it's the fast pace of the sound machine at North Carolina Central University. Thank you for joining us here today. Or the slow, methodical snake walk of the famed Marching 100 at Florida A&M. Let's go! Hey, turn up! Or perhaps the platinum sound of Shaw University. The pageantry of marching bands at historically black colleges and universities is something that cannot be duplicated. They leave it all on the field. Even Pepsi sees and knows that with the recent release of this commercial called the Halftime Game. Well, it's like none other, right? I mean, like you want to strike up the band if you're a football player. ESPN HBCU color analyst and Florida a grad Tiffany Green knows that experience firsthand. She sees it every Saturday in the fall while she calls the action on the gridiron. It's the soundtrack for the football game. So there is no football game without a band. She knows for many, the halftime show really is the true attraction. I would argue that they are equally as important as the football team. At North Carolina Central. Coming in freshman year, that's my first time marching. When it comes to the sound machine, drum majors Donnell Troy Jr. and Hassan Gaddy aren't playing around. Being in the marching band, of course, you create more of a family aura. So when you're here, it's like, I actually feel like home. The culture is just very different. It's very fun to be in and just, you know, just have fun. The band director, Thurman Hollins. Marching band that was founded in 1938 on this campus. Tells me the 130 plus piece band and its rich history really teach as much about life as it does music. We represent the entire school all in one ensemble. And when it comes to class, it's about striking that right chord for success. That's like a part of the daily announcements. You know, go to class. Uh, we, um, we break them into actually clusters, the students by major within the band too, so they can mentor each other and tutor each other. For HBCUs like Shaw, the bands are really more than just an opportunity to fill the stands and get people all excited about a game and really just come have a good time. They really are sort of like educational Pied Pipers, if you will. They lure prospective students to come here to Shaw and other schools to keep that educational legacy going. And that is on full display in this McDonald's commercial featuring a Shaw University grad and her son who marched in his mother's footsteps. This is something that I never uh, would have uh, dreamt of. Shaw's band director Andre King tells me the band and the football program went away until two decades ago. Next year will be our 20th year anniversary here um, with bringing back football and marching band. But like the commercial shows, band is a great way to attract students, both legacy and first timers alike, and cement a legacy. It is a blessing that, you know, HBCUs as a whole is being recognized. Whether it's the tasty sounds of Shaw and McDonald's in 2021, the unmistakable sound machine at Central. The FAMU marching band in the 80s or now. The rich history of HBCU marching bands will ring through for years to come. The atmosphere is just, it's an uproar. Without the band, it's just a game. In Raleigh, North Carolina, I'm Rod Carter. Through religion, food, the arts, and more, African American history plays an essential role in American society. From racial inequities to historic achievements, African Americans have inspired and thrived. Thank you so much for taking this journey with us. For more stories and the influence of African American history, visit our website at WNCT.com. For Honoring Black History, I'm Ken Watlington.